so for the second uh, for the second lecture in the afternoon, um, we started with potential games. Uh, if you're not really an expert in uh, in uh, in game theory, maybe this was not very clear. But I have to to recall you what what we did. This was a way to make a connection between minfield games on the one side and minfield control on the other side. So minfield control. <laughs> This is another problem where you want to find a global minimizer on the whole population. Really, this is not exactly the same modeling problem. Instead of having competing individuals, you have cooperating individuals. And so they work together to minimize the global cost to the society, which is not the same. And so this is another formulation. And I told you that from a PD point of view or from a control theory point of view, in the end, you ended up with a control problem over fokker planck equations. And I told you that this was connected with benamou brenier formulation of uh, optimal transportation. So this is what we started from, where we started from yesterday in the afternoon. And then I went back to midfield games in a more complex case when you have a common noise. So then I told you that uh, the PDE system became a stochastic PDE system. And uh, unfortunately, you have to say, what does the hamilton jacobi bellman equation becomes under the presence of the common noise? And then you need the theory of backward stochastic differential equation. So this was a bit difficult at this, uh, at this stage. I gave you some strategy to study existence and uniqueness. Instead of splitting in existence on the one side and uniqueness on the other side, we said we can have directly a uniqueness and existence argument when the coefficients are monotonous by using a continuation argument. Well, this was a bit technical, but maybe for those of you who want to push, to push further the analysis, it could be interesting to have this in mind. And the very last part of the lecture yesterday was about something different, which was the master equation, which is to provide an Eulerian point of view of a mean field game. So you sit, at an initial condition for your population and an initial condition for the tagged player that you want to follow in the population. And you say, I want to compute the value of the game for these uh, uh, initial conditions. And so we derived, we derived an equation for this value of the game. And this equation, we said that this was the master equation. This is not a hamilton jacobi equation. This is something that I didn't really mention yesterday. If I wanted to do the same for the mean field control problem, I could write down a hamilton jacobi equation. And possibly, uh, if I had a potential game, this was a question I had yesterday at the end of the talk, if I had a potential game, the master equation would be the derivative of the hamilton jacobi equation. So this, is, this would be the connection between the two. Okay, so now what do we want to do today? In this lecture of this morning, we want to come back to games with finite number of particles, because this was our starting point from the modeling point of view. And in practice, this is exactly what happens. You, you, never, you always have a finite number of particles. And you want to say, first question is, how can you use the information that is provided by the minfield game when you plug, you plug it back into uh, into the particle system. So this is the very first question. Is it really useful to solve the main field game? What are the informations that are supplied by the analysis of the main field game? So this is one first question. Another question is the over direction, which is a bit more subtle. You start from an equilibrium of the uh, finite game, and you want to prove that asymptotically it converges to a solution of the main field game. And you will see that this is more subtle to study. And to do that, I will explain to you that you can use the master equation. And this is one possible interest for having the master equation is that you can use the regularity of the solution to the master equation to study the convergence and to get a rate of convergence uh, from the particle system to the limit system. So this will be basically the program this morning. I will be quite slow because this is demanding in terms of notation and, uh, and tools. But if you have any questions, uh, do not hesitate to stop. Uh, so this is the first uh, slide. Uh, it works. And you see that I did a lot of progresses since yesterday. 
since you no longer have the, the back button at the, the bottom of the page. Uh, so this is the connection between midfield games and end player games. So a little bit of notation so that you remember what we did uh, yesterday. So you start with a very simple, uh, very simple uh, uh, notation. So these are the dynamics. Here you have the, the common noise with this uh, eta, but you can get, you can check eta is equal to zero to simplify. Uh, you saw yesterday uh, some strategies to solve the, uh, the main field game in the presence of eta, and you saw the shape of the master equation in the presence of eta, and you saw that this was more difficult or this was more complex. Um, and this is absolutely uh, possible to let eta is equal to zero to have something that is simpler. Even when it is equal to zero, all these questions remain absolutely interesting, and there is uh, it makes sense. Uh, this was the cost functional, so the same as yesterday, and you see that once again I simplified a little bit, meaning that you just have a separate cost, running cost between you have the potential energy and the, and the kinetic energy on the on the control. But this is just to, to simplify. We mentioned this uh, yesterday. Okay, so there are several uh, several questions. So the first one is what I told you. Uh, I would like to define or to to emphasize some connection between the end player game, so the game with a finite number of players, and the main field game. And another related question, but you will see that there are several ways to make the connection. And another related question will be to prove the convergence of the Nash equilibria of the finite player system to the limit of the midfield game. So this is, I'm, I'm just repeating myself because this is what I told you. This is our program for this morning lecture. Just to emphasize the difficulty, uh, just to emphasize the difficulty for one moment and to explain to you why, why this, uh, this question of convergence is quite subtle. If you remember what we did uh, yesterday in the, in the very first lecture, I told you that when you solve a, a game, you expect or you want to focus on strategies in feedback form. And so an equilibria here, if you think of an equilibrium, you have the capital N in, the, in, uh, in index, so it means that this is really for the game with finite, a finite number of particles. As I told you yesterday, you have to think about it as a function of the states of all the particles. And I told you, certainly it makes sense. I will come back to this question. This is just to give you a flavor of the difficulties that we are going to encounter uh, this morning. I told you, well, it makes perfect sense to assume that uh, there is a dominant uh, state, which is the state of the player i itself. Uh, so i is this index, and this is the same as the i that you have when you complete the equilibrium <laughs> strategy. And then you see the rest of the population, and when you see the rest of the population, you don't care about the order of the particles. You can make a permutation. Uh, basically, this would be the same. The very, very big difficulty is that you have functions on wider and wide, wider spaces. And if you want to think of any compactness arguments on those functions, this is difficult. Because usually, when you want to do compactness arguments, you need a bit of regularity on, on the functions. But since the dimension is going to increase and increase again and again, it's quite difficult and it's in fact very challenging to get some a priori estimates on the regularity of those feedback functions. And this is the reason why compactness arguments are quite difficult. Anyway, I will show you at the very end of this, uh, of this lecture that you can have compactness methods, but then you have to relax the notion of controls that you use in order to, to compactify and to have a relevant notion so of compactness. Uh, so this is in fact, uh, part of the very last uh, slides that I'm going to show you today. Well, so this is just a, a summary of the agenda. Uh, and instead, very first, I'm going to use the master equation. And then I will come back to this point next. Um, okay. So here, <clears throat> assume that I have solved the, uh, the main field game. To simplify, everything is, uh, is smooth in the limit. So I have the solution to the master equation. And I want to use this information in order to solve 
the end player game. So what I'm going to say is that, well, that's fine. I have solved the asymptotic problem. And if you remember yesterday, we had this calligraphic Q, which was the value of the game. If you forgot the definition of this calligraphic Q, you can just replace by the solution to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So if you remember well, in fact, the definition of this calligraphic Q was given in terms of the solution to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And it makes sense to replace this calligraphic Q by little, v, little u with the notation we had yesterday. And then you just keep the first two arguments and you forget for the last one. This was exactly the same definition. I, I define calligraphic Q in terms of little u. Anyway, what it says is that, in fact, if you have this calligraphic Q here, and if you choose for any player i, if you choose this as a strategy, so meaning that you compute your strategy where you are and given the state of the population, then this is almost a Nash equilibrium. So when you come back to the end player game, this is almost a Nash equilibrium in the sense that if I have a deviation, if one player deviates, she can increase or decrease a little bit the cost, but the gain will be less and less as capital N tends to infinity. So this is not exactly a Nash. A Nash is to say that if I'm deviating, then there is no way for me to decrease the cost. But here, what I'm saying is that if I use the strategy given by the main field game, I plug this into the particle system, then I could possibly decrease a little bit the cost, but then the gain would be very, very small, meaning that you see that the benefit for a possible deviation would be at most some epsilon n, and this epsilon n would tend to zero when n tends to infinity. So this is a general philosophy of Minfield game. When you solve the Minfield game and you come back to the n particle system, you don't have a Nash equilibrium, but you have something that is called an almost Nash equilibrium. So it means that if somebody deviates from the equilibrium, then the gain, the gain is at best very, very, very small. And this is smaller and smaller when capital N tends to infinity. We know what epsilon n is. And this is something that we could compute. We know the, the decay uh, depending on the smoothness of the coefficient. So we have a rate for the, for the, the decrease for the way uh, at which the, the gain would decrease when n tends to infinity. This result, uh, it, it's formulated maybe in a, in a quite complicated way for you because I defined in terms of calligraphic U the strategy that I plug in the particle system, but in fact, choose eta is equal to zero. If I choose eta is equal to zero, remember the forward backward system of two PDs that we got yesterday, Hamilton Jacobi and Fokker Planck. I solve Hamilton Jacobi. Hamilton Jacobi, since eta is equal to zero, it's not random. So there are only two parameters inside time and the space location. And I could completely reformulate this result by saying that I'm writing dx of little u, where little u is the solution to Hamilton Jacobi, of t and capital X. Here, I decided to use calligraphic u because I wanted to emphasize what happens in the presence of the common noise. But when there is no common noise, this is much easier. And you could say, well, I just put dx of little u, txt, and I, and I, I play this strategy in the particle system. And then you will have the same result. And maybe this is a bit subtle, but what is the difference between writing in terms of calligraphic U and writing in terms of little u? Well, in fact, to write in terms of little u, there is no need for uniqueness to the MFG system, to the forward backward system of two PDEs, uh, Hamilton Jacobi and Fokker Planck. I'm just given one possible equilibrium, one possible equilibrium. So one solution to the Fokker Planck and one solution to the Hamilton Jacobi. This is what I call little u. 
and I use this little u here, and I get the almost Nash equilibrium. So this is something that is in fact quite strong in the sense that I don't need to have uniqueness of a midfield game to play this strategy. I am given one solution, Poker Planck and Hamilton Jacobi little u. I play the derivative of little u, and this is fine. I get an almost Nash equilibrium. And this was this result, this was the original result that people really, really liked in the midfield games because it says a lot about the decrease of complexity that I was mentioning. If you see the shape of the strategy that you are playing in the end, so forget for this new bar now, forget for this new bar, maybe this was a bad choice for me to use this, uh, this notation. I don't think I have, uh, ah no, this is here, so I'm sorry, this is here. So let me, let me jump to this, uh, to this side, this will be uh, easier for you. Uh, so exactly, choose eta is equal to zero. So uh, this will clarify exactly what I was saying. And so don't re require uniqueness. So this is absolutely consistent with what I was just telling you. And so there is no master equation, but you don't care for the strategy of constructing approximate Nash uh, equilibrium the particle system. And so you just replace you just replace dx of calligraphy q by dx u, where u is just the solution of uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And you say that everybody now is playing this strategy. So this is absolutely consistent with what I was telling you. And so in the particle system, now you require that everybody uses exactly. So I'm going to come back a few slides before. So sorry for those of you who are in the room. Uh, this is exactly the, the the place where the uh, the connection stopped. And so what I was telling you is that, in fact, to, to compute, let me move my pointer. So what I was telling you is that to understand the strategy of construction of an approximate equilibrium, think of the case when eta is equal to zero. So if you think of the forward backward system of two PDEs, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, this is completely deterministic and you can denote the solution by u of mu, just to say that mu is the solution to the Fokker Planck equation. And what I'm going to say next, I don't need to study the master equation. I don't need to study the, the value of the game. And in particular, what I'm going to say next works even if I don't have uniqueness. So I take any solution to the mean free game system. I don't care about unicity of it. And I'm going to follow the same strategy as before. Uh, which is, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what I do is that I take the solution given by the, uh, the strategy given by the solution to the HJB equation. So this is minus the derivative of the gradient of little u. And I say in the particle system, everybody now is playing this strategy. So this is what you see at the bottom of the slide. So this is the particle system. Everybody is playing this strategy. I choose that. And I said before, the, uh, just after you, you lost the connection online, I said, well, this is very simple from a, uh, a numerical, a practical point of view, uh, because you just have to compute if you are one player in the population to compute the optimal or the equilibrium strategy, you just have to know where you are. You don't care about where the others are. So everybody's taking the same solution of the mean for the game. Everybody, everybody's playing the same. And so uh, where to compute this uh, in practice, there is no need uh, to have a look where, at where the others are. And so this is what we call the distributed <laughs> strategy in practice. And once again, I emphasize for those of you who are online, you see that here to compute where I am, or to compute my strategy, I just need to know where I am. I don't need to know where the others are. This is implicitly encoded in this bold mu that you have in little u. Okay, next, what I told you is how to come back uh, to the particle system. I should see exactly what is my loss uh, when I compute my cost. And uh, this is the way I'm going to say that I have something that is almost a Nash with almost being better and better when n tends to infinity. And uh, so I think that when you, for those of you who are online, you missed uh, this slide, which is almost nothing. This is to say that in fact, if everybody in the particle system is playing exactly 
this as a feedback with the minus, then you have that the um, you have that if you take k particles, they are independent. So this is even better than a convergence. I said that this was a convergence, but in fact, this is better. They are independent and they have the same law, which is exactly the law of the solution to the, uh, uh, to the stochastic equation that you have on the top line. And the law of this is exactly the solution to the Fokker-Frank equation. So things are completely consistent. And it means that if you take the empirical measure of those players, so mu bar n, remember that this was yesterday the empirical measure. If you take the empirical measure, then it gets closer and closer to the theoretical distribution, which is exactly the solution of the Fokker Frank equation. And the simple fact, or, or the, the simple reason why you have this convergence is that you have the empirical measure of IID particles. And so you know that. Uh, when n tends to infinity, it gets closer and closer <laughs> to the theoretical distribution, which is once again the solution to the Fokker Frank equation. And so, how you 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 use this information? You have you have now to plug this convergence in the study of the cost to say when I'm coming back to the cost involving capital M players, I'm not that far from having exactly the definition. Of a Nash equilibrium. So what we did here is just to see what happens at the level of the trajectories. Now I have to plug this information into the definition of the cost and to see what happens in the cost and what is the the, the small loss that I could have when computing my, uh, my when computing my cost. So this is the next slide, and I think that now I'm restarting from for all of you. Uh, this is just a recap of all the things that I have said this. Uh, um, for this uh, last uh, 30 minutes. So once again, you have this information. Everybody is playing this as a feedback. And you say, very first thing, when you compute the cost with these strategies, asymptotically, you get J star and J star. This is the equilibrium cost in the mean field game. So this is the cost that you observe in the mean field game at the fixed point or at the fixed point that you have taken. So the one uh, with uh, uh, new and the one with little new. So certainly for those of you who are online, maybe you missed uh, the argument. So I'm going to, to get back to it because I, I think that when the connection was lost, I came back to the definition of the cost to show you exactly that inside you have new bar n that appears and since I know that mu bar n is going to converge to mu, I can see quite easily using some nice assumption on the coefficients that uh, this uh, the cost with the n players is going to converge to the cost of the MFG. So let me uh, scroll back uh, just to to show this to you. Um, so yeah, this was this was the def this definition. So I think that all of you remember this definition, and you see that this was exactly the definition of the cost. So you see that. This empirical measure, this is what I told you. Now, this is an empirical measure on IID particles, and I know that it's going to, to converge to a mu of t. And so, asymptotically, I get exactly the cost, uh, the, the equilibrium cost in the energy. So, this is exactly what I told you. Sorry, uh, I told you here. So, this line, there is no, no big difficulty, just convergence. Now you, you have to see what happens if you take somebody that deviates. Because I want to say if somebody deviates, well, uh, the gain, there could be a, a positive gain, but in fact, the gain is going to be at best a, a very small, uh, a very small positive real and, and the smallness, uh, it will be smaller and smaller and as capital n tends to infinity. So, just to simplify, I did this for open loop, uh, um, open loop strategy. So I'm going to recall quite briefly what it means, but you, you don't have to, to worry too much. What is interesting is the, is the philosophy here. So you take one player in the system, for instance, player one, things are more or less exchangeable. So it could be the same for any players. And you assume that the player is going to deviate. <coughs> And so he chooses or she chooses another strategy. So uh, this strategy is what I call by, uh, by beta. Okay. 
if the energy that is included or that is encoded is in beta is very, very large, so this is the first line. So if uh, he's going or she's going to play a strategy with very, very high kinetic energy, certainly the cost is going to blow up. And so it's absolutely clear to me that the cost to this particle beta one, when the others keep playing the same strategy, here this is open loop, so keep playing means that I freeze omega per omega, the same realization of the strategies, but this would be the same if I had a, you know, feedback function, the analysis would be a little bit more involved, but the result would be uh, uh, basically the same. So clearly, since I am playing something with a very, very high kinetic energy, my cost is going to blow up. So there is no interest for me for playing something with a very, very high kinetic energy. So the interesting case is what happens when the kinetic energy is controlled, is controlled. And so when you, you have a kinetic energy that is controlled, well, certainly you see, you can really see what is the impact of X1 of the player that is deviating onto the empirical measure, because you see that the empirical measure, you have a mass, one over N, the delta mass of X1. X1 is driven by beta and the noise, but beta is uh, of finite kinetic energy. So you really see uh, the impact on the, uh, on the global cost uh, to, to J1, to one. And so what you see is that at best, uh, she can improve a little bit. She can improve a little bit the uh, uh, the um, the cost, but not that much. And we know, in fact, we know explicitly uh, what is epsilon, and it depends on the smoothness of the coefficients or the regularity uh, in the measure argument. <laughs> and at the same stage, uh, in fact, the others cannot improve as well. Or if if you are deviating, the others cannot really improve their uh, their cost, which is connected with this notion of Pareto equilibria in, in game theory. But this is, this is a sad result that uh, we, we don't really care. The, the key fact is that if, beta, if X1 is deviating, then she's going to pay more up to some uh, small error epsilon. So really, really, I insist that from the practical point of view, this is a very interesting result. It says you solve the limit problem by this fixed point. Uh, and then uh, you, you plug this strategy and it gives you a very simple way to, to play the strategy because the, the control are distributed. Okay, so this was the first part uh, in, in the discussion. So uh, what about time? No, maybe I should carry on for sure. Uh, if you have any question on this, uh, uh, tell me. If not, I'm going to, to carry on the, the analysis. Just a small question. What if we replace mu by mu and uh, do we still have a quasi-natural equilibrium in the You, I think you mean here. Uh, yes, and uh, in the next. Uh, yes, yeah. If you take uh, u mu n instead. <coughs> yes. Uh, so the, the for those of you who are online, the question is: uh, What happens if I try to 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 replace mu here by mu n? So there are two things. The first one is, what does it mean to replace mu by mu n in, in little u? So certainly, uh, the right way to see that would be, would be to say, I use the value of the game, and the value of the game, in fact, I know exactly in which way it depends on the state of the population. This is a function of the current state of the population, and here I could replace I could replace uh, mu by mu bar n. I could do that, and I will come back to this question next. The big difficulty if I do this is that I require some regularity of calligraphic u with respect to mu bar n. That's the difficulty. If you study particle system and you lose regularity with respect to the measure argument of, uh, of your coefficients, it becomes very difficult. So the answer is yes, it works. If you have in this writing that this calligraphic U, so the value of the game is regular with respect to the last argument. It works when the game has a unique solution and the, this unique solution is sufficiently stable. This is more or less what I told you yesterday. If the setting is monotonous plus a nice uh, smoothness coefficients, smooth coefficients, then indeed we have that calligraphic U is regular with respect to this argument. 
So this is one answer to your question. Now, in fact, here I cannot really do the same because here, if I don't have uniqueness, what is the meaning of replacing mu bar or mu bold by mu bar n? It's not clear because u is solved in the in the mu u is solving the Hamilton Jacobi equation when inside um, I am given uh, I am given the environment for the population. So it, it would be more difficult exactly here to say what it means. And even more, if I don't have uniqueness, uh, I don't have, I would not have nice stability properties of this uh, little u uh, with respect to a perturbation of the measure. So I think that in this writing, this is a bit uh, difficult to, to say what, uh, what you would obtain. Anyway, I will come back to this point next. Um, indeed, when we have sufficiently uh, a nice solution to the master equation, indeed, what you say makes sense, and it gives uh, it gives some nice information about the behavior of the of the game itself. But from the practical point of view, this is much easier to work with this solution. Really, I, I insist because once again, this is completely distributed. You don't need uh, to know uh, to know where the others are to compute your strategy. Oui. Oh. What you are able to construct this way is something that's close to being a Nash equilibrium. Exactly. Uh, do you know whether it's close to a real Nash equilibrium? Is it possible to? No. Um, this is a. Um, this is somehow the next line. Uh, we, the next part. So this is to say, uh, now I'm studying the Nash equilibria of the game, of the game, and I want to see of the finite game, and I want to see how far this is close or not. Uh, to the uh, to the solution given by the mean field game. So I think this is exactly your question. I'm solving the mean field game. I am using the information provided by the mean field game, and I want to see how far this is from the real equilibria of the finite game. And this is exactly uh, what I'm going to to. <coughs> but this is a more difficult question here. Indeed, as you say, uh, I'm not studying the distance between this almost Nash and the Nash of the finite game. Absolutely. So this is the next uh, part of the of the of this discussion, and back to the question of Quentin. Uh, this is exactly uh, the reverse procedure. So I'm starting from uh, I'm starting from the equilibria of the finite game, and I wonder whether they are far from from the solution to the mean field game. So this is another question. This is different from the question I wondered in the previous question. In the previous question, I, in the previous part, I just explained to you how to construct an almost match <laughs> by using the information supplied by the solution of the mean field game. Okay, so to explain to you the way it works, maybe this is a good point to remember uh, how we can construct Nash equilibria to a finite game. Uh, many of you uh, know uh, optimal control theory, and these are things that we uh, we saw yesterday again for optimal control you can compute the optimal strategies by solving a hamilton jacobi equation and basically the op the best strategies are given by the derivative let's say quite quickly the derivative of the solution to hg, to HG equation you have a similar result for games but this is more difficult because for games when you want to compute the nash equilibrium everybody is trying to minimize and so you you don't have one unique Hamilton Jacob, only one Jack Hamilton Jacobi equation. You have a system of Hamilton Jacobi equation. Everybody wants to minimize. And so you get a system of cathode equations. And this is what we are calling in the, in the literature a Nash system. So this is this is this horrible system that you have on the uh, on the slides. So this is Nash system. It says that back to the finite back to the finite uh, uh, game you can describe at least the markov equilibria so the, the equilibria for which the strategies are in markov uh, feedback form you can describe the strategies by means of this system of pd so let me describe a little bit what it means so you take a, a player uh, let's say player i and you want to have a look at its value. So the principle for the value is the same as uh, the value of the game yesterday. This is how much player R is going to pay 
while everybody follows the equilibrium strategies. Equilibrium for the n particle system. Now I completely forget the mean field gamma. Uh, I'm back to the original discussion that we had yesterday before taking the limits. So VNI, this is the cost you have to pay at equilibrium when you start from little, little t. And you see that there is a subtle notation. Maybe you, you don't really see uh, well, I don't know. X, this is bold in bold face. It means that this is a tuple because it is not sufficient to have the knowledge of my own state. I need the knowledge of all the players in the population to compute my cost because my cost is going to depend on where the orders are. So uh, bold X, this is a tuple of, uh, of, um, of states. You see that, in fact, maybe this is implicitly hidden here, ball X. This is a collection of X1, X capital N. So X1 is the state of player one, X2 is the initial state of player two, and X capital N is the initial state of player N. And so once again, V and I, this is the, uh, the equilibrium cost that I have to pay when I know the initial states of the others, X1, X2, X capital N. The others, they are playing the strategy given by their function V and J. So you see that in fact, this is the same principle <laughs> as Hamilton Jacobi. The others, they are playing as strategies minus the derivative of the values. So think of Hamilton Jacobi, if you remember what we have been saying on Hamilton Jacobi, this case when the Hamiltonian is quadratic, uh, the, best, the, the best response or the best strategy is given by minus the derivative of Hamilton Jacobi, minus the derivative of the cost or, or of the value. And so here for player J, minus the derivative of the value, this is the strategy. So here this line accounts for the, the, the the dynamics of the orders somehow, or the first order dynamics of the orders. And now I am optimizing, I am player I, I am working in the field of, uh, in the cloud of uh, particles. I know what the particles, the orders are playing. This is minus the derivative of V and J. So in the direction XJ, I forgot to say, this is V and J and the derivative is in the direction XJ. And I am optimizing, so I solve a kind of Hamilton-Jacobi equation given the dynamics of the others. And so you, reco you recover or you, you recognize here the running cost. You recover the Hamiltonian. This is minus the derivative to the square. So dxi vni. So this is the derivative of my value. This is the square because I have the, the Hamiltonian. And the, on the top line here, you have the, the impact of the noises. So this is a bit subtle. Uh, in fact, it comes from a verification argument that is very, very similar to the verification argument you have for optimal control. And so everybody is playing independent noises. And so you have a sum of Laplace delta xj. And this is VNI, because when you expand VNI along the whole trajectory of the system, when you expand this by Ito's formula, you see a collection of Laplace, uh, Laplace operators applying to VNI. If you have a common noise, there, is, there are correlations between the noises, and you have this extra uh, second order terms. You can forget for this term in, uh, in the equation if this is too complicated, but it comes from the fact <laughs> that there are some additional correlations uh, between the particles. OK, so this is this big Nash system that characterizes somehow the, uh, the Markov equilibria in the, in the game. And this is a system. What about the boundary condition? Well, at terminal time, my cost, or the cost to player i, is given by j, uh, by g, sorry, by g, of xi, which is my own state, and the state of the population. Fine. Now you say, well, that's a nightmare or a very difficult equation. In fact, this equation, so first, a few words about complexity. You have capital N equations, and they are in dimension N times D. 
So you really see that this is highly complex. Okay, so really, really uh, think of this from a numerical point of view. Uh, this is uh, this is certainly a disaster. So, so the dimension is n times two. So this is another reason why maybe passing to the limit is is a very good idea. Uh, second point: this equation is the finite dimensional version of the master equation. So if you remember what we did yesterday, in fact. I am claiming that this system should be regarded as a discrete, discrete or finite dimensional version of the master equation. What does it mean? It means that I claim that we can have this convergence result, which is in fact one key point in the analysis. If you have a look at the cost that you pay at this Nash equilibrium, which is a Nash equilibrium for the n particle system. I have not taken the limit. In fact, this cost is very, very of this value is very close to the value of the game that is computed by using the main field game. So you see that now on this uh, last line, calligraphic Q, it depends on, I apply it on Xi, which is the state of player I, <laughs> and the state of the population. And I claim that the distance between the two should be smaller and smaller or should tend to zero when n tends to infinity and this is one key result in the field i'm starting from a markov equilibria of the uh, n particle system and the values in fact are very very close to the solution of the master equation so this will be part of the analysis that now we are going to to make but this is not for free i mean uh, the, the analysis is demanding and uh, you have to pay. Uh, you have to pay in terms of mass of math uh, to prove uh, to prove this result. So I'm going to give you some uh, some intuition. So uh, intuitively, why is this a discrete version of the master equation? I think that this is a very uh, very important computation. Um, in the book with Kardashian last year, Nons, we put this uh, this. Uh, heuristics or this intuitive derivation uh, at the very first page of the book so you can access this argument quite soon and i think that uh, just having a look at this this is very interesting and maybe this is more interesting than the rest of the computation themselves um, so the ad is as follows the ad is to say you take the solution of the master equation when I say the solution, this is uh, not very uh, rigorous because I should say, I assume that there is a classical solution to the master equation, which is unique. But once this is classical, it must be unique. So the key part is to say, okay, I'm going to restrict myself to a situation where I know that the master equation has a classical solution. I remind you of what we said yesterday. If the coefficients are smooth, plus we have monotonicity, that's fine. We have a classical solution to the master equation. And now, exactly as in numerical analysis, we are trying to benefit from the smoothness of the limiting object to study convergence. So this is something that is classical in the numerical analysis. So you say, okay, the limiting object is smooth and it should give me a lot of information on the convergence itself. Okay, so how do we do that? We say we have the value of the main field game, so calligraphic U, and I'm going to project this value in finite dimension. I'm starting from the limiting object and I'm going to project it back onto the finite dimensional uh, problem. So what is the finite dimension problem? This is when I have Rd to the power n, so tuples x1, x2, x capital N. So this is exactly what I do here. I let little u, so keep in mind that little v is for the solution to the Nash system in finite dimension, and little u comes from the infinite dimensional analysis or the, the, the analysis of the missing game. And so you project back and you say, I take a time, I take a tuple bold x, and I define this is a definition calligraphic u, txi, and the empirical measure or the uniform measure on x1, x2. So this is a way to project back. If you remember what we did yesterday, <laughs> In the, uh, in the construction of the Wasserstein derivative, I told you we have a dictionary to pass from 
the Wasserstein derivative to Euclidean derivative, this is exactly what we did. We said to recover the finite dimensional setting, we are using uh, uniform measures. I do that. And I say, okay, I'm going to see whether this finite dimensional projection solves the Nash system. So you see, I'm, I'm not saying I take the Nash system and I want to solve the master equation. No, I do the converse. I take the solution up to the Nash to the master equation and I plug it into the Nash system. And now I'm going to work in somewhat dim finite dimension to make the comparison between V and I and U and I. So V is the solution to the Nash system. U and I is the approximation of the projection given from the infinite dimensional setting. And I'm now comparing, I'm now seeing whether this uh, finite dimensional projection solves or not the Nash system. And the answer is that yes, it solves up to a small remainder term. And then this would be the key point in the analysis. So let me do that. Okay, so now you are paying a lot uh, of notation, of a lot of notation, because you have to remember those derivatives that we used yesterday. Don't worry, uh, I will just show you on one simple term and then you will admit that for the other terms, it works in the same. Let me just do this. I think on, on two terms, the Hamiltonian and, and the drift. If you remember uh, what we said yesterday, we said when we take a Euclidean derivative on the finite dimensional projection, well, we can express this derivative in terms of the Wasserstein. This is absolutely a key result uh, to understand the, the Wasserstein derivative, at least in this, uh, in this problem. So I take xi, the I'm sorry, I take this u and i, and I take the derivative with respect to some xj. There are two cases. If j is not equal to i, so it means that, in fact, I'm just taking the derivative with respect to one input <laughs> that is hidden in the empirical measure. And so this is exactly what I have here. When j here is not equal to i, I take the derivative dxj, I get 1 over n, and then the Wasserstein derivative. This is the first complication. When i is not equal to j. If i is equal to j, this is different because if i is equal to j, the first term that I get in the derivative is in fact the derivative in the Euclidean variable that is in the definition of calligraphic u, which is the private state of player i. And so I have another writing. The first order term is in fact of order zero. This is the derivative in space. And then I have a remainder that is of size one over n. You see that on the second line, this is of size one over n, but on the first line, this is of, of macroscopic size. So that they don't play at the same level. But you have to keep in mind that for sure, is, if i is fixed, you have capital N minus one j's, which are not equal to i. So you have n minus term, and all of them are of order one over n. So the macroscopic contribution will be very important. Now you say, well, I want to see, I want to see when I have the Nash system, if I replace formally V and I by U and I, why do I get? So back to the Nash system, you see, I take the left-hand side of this horrible system. I take the left-hand side, so before the zero, and I replace V by little u. And I say, is it a early solution? Do I get something that is very, very close to zero? And I do this for any of the terms. So let me start with the simple uh, last term. What does happen if I replace V by u? So this is what I propose to do exactly in this line. So I replace V by U and I say, uh, well, uh, uh, this is DX I uh, U and I, I can uh, use this formula and this will be DX of calligraphic U plus uh, a, a remainder term that is of size one over capital. So in fact, what I'm doing is that I try to express the left-hand side in the Nash system for little u in terms of the, all the derivatives of calligraphic u. Because what I have in mind is to obtain something that is exactly the master equation plus a remainder term. 
Let me do the same for uh, for the uh, for the second line. So for this term, I, I won't do the same for the Laplace term. This is a, this is a bit painful. So let me just do this for for this uh, second term. So you see, so now this is more difficult because you have uh, I, you have J. So here this is D X J U and J. So you have to apply the top line here, but with I is equal to J. So you see that I have D X U. And this is xj because here the, the index is j and this is computed at the empirical measure. Okay, and then what you have to do next is dx i u and j. And now uh, i is not equal to j, so I get one over n on the front of this. I have the sum of all the particles, and I get the Wasserstein derivative. And this is computed at xi because here this is this is an i, and but the derivative is computed at xj. So uh, it's a bit uh, it's a bit complicated because I have one derivative in xj, but this is the value to player i. So here this is i, and here this is j, and then plus a remainder of size one over n. And now I say, well, in fact, this sum, this big sum. This is not that far from an integral with respect to the, the empirical measure. So all the sum that I have, I'm going to write them as empiric as integral with respect to the empirical measure. This is doable uh, up to small uh, remainder of, of size one over n. And I say, well, I'm just integrated xj with respect to the empirical measure. So this is what you have. So I'm replacing S xj by v. And here, this is the same. I am replacing xj by v. <coughs> I know that uh, j is not equal to i, but uh, up to a new definition of uh, capital O of 1 over n, this is fine. And in fact, if you come back to the master equation that we had yesterday, I'm not going to do that because you, then you have to, to change the style. Oh, maybe I have this on the, uh, on the, if you press the button. So that's a good point. So this was the shape of the master equation we had yesterday. So maybe uh, you don't remember, but, uh, the first order terms, there was this integral and there was this, uh, this Hamiltonian. The next two terms, they were exactly, uh, they were exactly the, the second order terms that you have in the Nash, but I'm not going to study them. So let me do exactly what I told you. I know that the equation is satisfied at every mu. This is an equation of the special probability measures. What do I choose as mu? I choose the empirical measure. So you see that you have a very, very big space and you choose as measure mu the empirical measure itself. So I replace in this equation, I replace mu by the empirical measure, mu by the empirical measure. And this is exactly the term that you observed on the previous slide for the approximation of the second line in the Nash system. And the same for the Hamiltonian, you recognize my approximation of the Hamiltonian in the Nash system. And so, Playing the same, exactly the same game with the second order derivatives in the Nash system, you end up with the following property. So back to the slide, you end up that all the terms that you have in the Nash system, when you replace by V and I, by U and I, all these terms, all of them, this is the master equation plus a remainder of size capital O of one over N. So U and I is a solution to the Nash system up to a remainder and you can quantify what is this remainder term. This is capital O of one over N. So this was a complicated computation and maybe uh, we'll make a short break after that. Just to summarize, we started, we wanted to study the asymptotic behavior of the Nash equilibria of the finite game. We said, well, there is a system of PDE to describe this. This is game theory uh, from a PDE point of view. This is this horrible system. I want to make the connection between this horrible system and the master equation. I'm using the fact that I know how to solve the master equation in some cases. I use this information and I project back <laughs> in finite dimension and then I compare the projection 
And I want to see the projection as an early solution of the Nash system. And so this is the conclusion of this analysis. If you replace VNI by UNI, so this projection, you see that your UNI almost solves, almost solves the Nash system up to this remainder term that is less than C over N. I, I'm missing equal to zero. I, sorry, I, I forgot to equal to zero. So we did one step in the analysis. It's not the conclusion of the story. Not, I have not proven so far that indeed you had convergence of the Nash equilibria. But in fact, you got something that is really, really important. You got the fact that certainly uh, using the information from the infinity, you get something that should be very close to an object that plays an important role in the analysis of the uh, of the games to the night to the n player system. So now the next the next question, and this will be after the break. How can we use this capital O of one over n in the analysis? of the behavior of the Nash equilibria when n tends to infinity. And so now the question is uh, how to use this information uh, in order to, to solve our question, which is uh, to study the convergence of the, of the Nash equilibria to the solution of the mean. So to understand the, the, the general philosophy, I will make a detour. Um, and I will come back to uh, a question, which is uh, one question that I mentioned yesterday about propagation of chaos. Because after all, what we want to do is to prove a form of propagation of chaos, except that we are now combining mean field approximation and optimization. Propagation of chaos, when I speak about propagation of chaos, what I have in mind is really when you come back to a standard mean field of particle system, you have the fact that asymptotically the particles become independent and the empirical measure of the system converges to the theoretical measure that solves the mackin bazoff equation. So remember that this was one of the very first slides that we had yesterday morning. And I'm going to make this detour by showing you that, in fact, in this setting, when there is no optimization, I can use a similar strategy based on a similar form of the master equation. And then it certainly for you, this will be a way to understand the notion of master equation, uh, maybe uh, not in another manner, but in a simpler setting and to see exactly what it means. So I have a look at this uh, at this mackin bazoff equation. So the velocity field inside, there is an interaction between the state of the particle and the law of the population, and possibly have this additional noise. There is no common noise. The DW, DW, this is an independent noise in my system. So here, this is when I compute the law of X, the law is computed over the realization <laughs> of the noise. This is not conditional. Oh. Okay, and <clears throat> in fact, when you have a look at these dynamics, you could say I take an initial measure, so a random variable x0 with an initial measure, and I'm going to see how this initial measure is transported by this mackin of dynamics. So this is exactly what I'm going to say here. In fact, I observe that the law of xt so the law of the system at time t only depends on the initial law of the system. Which means that if I take two random variables that are different, but they have the same laws, the law of the solution, the laws of the solutions are the same. This is not a big surprise because this is just saying that if you have a look at the laws, you get a closed equation, which is the fokker Frank equation. Okay. And now this is, you say, in fact, I regard these dynamics, or if you think you want to think in terms of PD, you could write down the, the, the focal point equation. What you do is that in, uh, in PD or in uh, operator theory, we, we would say we define a semi-group 
So we see the action of this equation on a test function. So precisely, you take a test function phi. So this is a function that works or that is defined on the space of probability measures. <coughs> so it evaluates phi of probability measures. And I'm going to transport this function by the solution of the stochastic differential equation, which is to say that you take an initial measure. So the law of X zero is whatever you want. So this is an issue, an initial state for the population. And you say, I'm going to see, I'm going to, to denote by PT of phi. PT is the usual notation for a semi group. So PT of phi, so this is the transport of phi somehow. This is phi acting on the law of X zero. There is no star here. This is a typo. So you see phi of the law of X zero. I take my test function. It is acting on the law of XT. And since the law of XT in the end only depends on time and the law of X0, I can say that it gives me a new function that I denote by PT phi and that is acting on the initial law of the system. If you think of a transport PD, this is exactly what you do in finite dimension. In finite dimension, if you remove the dependence on the law, if you get, and if you remove DW, so you get just a first order OD, well, you can transport or you can test the action of a function, or you can take a, you can take a test function and let it act onto the dynamics of the OD. So you say, I'm going to see what is the action of a test, a test function phi on the flow that is generated by the OD. And this is exactly what happens in the method of characteristics uh, to associate with your PD, with your SD, uh, with your OD, I'm sorry, uh, a PD. And so this is exactly the same question here. What about the dynamics of the semi-group <coughs> that is generated by uh, this mckin vazov equation? And what I'm claiming is that this mckin vazov equation, this is the characteristic of a transport equation on the space of probability measures. This is exactly the analog of what you had or what you have for an ODE. An ODE, you can regard an ODE as the characteristics of a transport PD in finite dimension or on, finite, on the Euclidean space. And here, this is the same. Your Fokker Planck equation of your Mackin Bezoff equation the, are the characteristics of this master equation on the space of probability measure. This is absolutely the same. And the argument to do this, so maybe if I press the button, you can do that. This is based on the same chain rule as the one that I mentioned yesterday. So what I'm saying is that you take your test function phi. I'm sorry for the stars. You should remove the stars. This is a bad notation. So I take phi of the law of xt, and I expand by Ito's for, by the chain rule. Not exactly Ito's formula. This is the chain rule that we obtained yesterday. And if you remember what we said yesterday, the action is given by the derivative of phi, the Wasserstein derivative, and this is acting on the velocity field. Here there is a typo, another typo. This is d mu phi at the low and at the random variable. Here I am missing x t star. And then in the same way, there are the second order derivatives. And so if you take d over dt, let's say at time t is equal to 0, which is exactly d of pt of phi, you get exactly b, so this, acting on d mu phi plus uh, this uh, here, this. Um, second order derivative. So this is just a consequence of the chain rule that we got yesterday. Okay. So we say that the semi-group solves this, uh, this uh, transport equation. And now the question 
back to my program, the question is how to use this linear equation on the space of probability measures to revisit propagation of chaos. And this is uh, my detour uh, towards the analysis of the equilibrium. So come back to the particle system. So you say, well, this is the original Mackinder's of equation. And here, this is the particle system. So you see that I have replaced the law by the empirical measure, which is exactly what I do in the original n player game that I mentioned to you. And now what I'm going to say is that I'm going to test my summing group along the empirical measure. What you know from the method of characteristic is that if you test the action of the summing group on the solution of the mackinder of equation, on the solution of the characteristic, it must be zero. Maybe this is one of the two buttons that you have here, and we will check after that. And so if this is a zero, I will take, I will do the same computation at the empirical measure, and I expect to get almost a zero. So let me just check what I wanted to tell you here. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Yes, exactly. This is just to say that if you take <laughs> the semi group, PT of phi of L, X zero is phi of L, the law of X T, X T. Now, if you make a shift in time, so if you have the semi group at time capital T minus T, and you let it act on the law of X T, since this is a semi group, at the end, this will be phi of the law of X capital T. So you see that this is additive, meaning that you, you just add time t, and then there is another increment of time, capital T minus middle t, and so this is indeed phi of the law of x capital T. So this is independent of little t, which is exactly what I told you. If you test your semi group along the characteristic, then you get something that is constant in time. So this is for the true solution of the mastery of the um, of the Mackin-Vazov equation. And so now you expect that when you replace the theoretical measure by the empirical measure, this should be very close to zero. And this is a way, certainly, this is a way uh, to visualize uh, to, vi to visualize the fact that mu bar n is very close to mu. So what I'm, go I'm going to do is exactly that. I expand. So you take the time derivative of the semi-group expanded as at mu bar n t. And so I think that the so this is the second button here. So this is the computation. So maybe for those of you who have to make a report, it could be one possible computation in your report. Uh, so you take this, this derivative in time. And now you say, well, this is just Ito's formula. This is just Ito's formula. And so you make, uh, you make the, the, the computation. So you have the derivative in time that appears. So there's a sign minus because time is reversed. Time is reversed because you want t minus t plus little t is equal to capital T. And then you have the action of the first order terms, okay, acting on the drift. Here, this is the second, these are the second order terms. I think that those ones uh, are, are coming from where they are coming from the, the shape of the second order derivatives on the space of probability measures that you re-express in terms of Euclidean derivatives. So this one and the last one, really they, comes from the, they come from the shape of the second order derivatives of a function that is projected on the Euclidean space. And this, this one, fourth term is the stochastic integral in your, uh, in your uh, Ito's formula. So this is a quite simple computation. What is difficult here is just the notation. But in terms of math, you just use the dictionary for passing from the derivatives on the space of probability measures to the Euclidean derivatives, and you combine this with Ito's formula. If you don't know Ito's formula and you want to write down this, uh, this computation, you remove the noise. You just remove the DW and you can make the same computation. So this is the way it works. And you have three terms in red and you recognize the master equation, but the linear equation, uh, which is the transport of PDE on the space of probability measures. So you have a cancellation 
you have a concentration in fact here uh, between the uh, basically you want to explain the fact that there is there will be a consolation between the terms in red you just have to re-express exactly this uh, these integrals as uh, as um, Here, by the way, I think this is a mistake. This is mu bar and this is a typo. I should correct this on the slide. This is a typo because the drift that you have in the particle system, this is, it really depends on mu bar n. So you really have a consolation between these terms by using the shape of the master equation and by expressing the master equation at the empirical measure. So the only two terms that remain are the last one and the penultimate one. And you see that when n tends to infinity, in fact, they tend to zero. This is exactly what I claimed in the in, back to the slides. In fact, I claim that when you expand, so you just have one over n times the stochastic integral. If you compute the local variance of this, the local variance, this will be one over n squared. And since those terms are driven by independent runner motions, locally you add the variances. And so it means that the variance is n divided by n squared. So this term is going to disappear. And here you have capital N terms, but this is divided by n squared. And so it disappears as well. So you see that this is, it tends to zero. And so you, the action of the semi group onto the solution of the particle system tends to zero. And this is a way to visualize propagation of chaos by means of the transport PD. On the space of probability measures. And we are doing exactly the same, except that now this is in a non linear setting, but except for this, th this is very, very, very uh, close. Okay, so now we have to adapt to the non linear setting and we have to make clear what is the notion of characteristics. Well, the notion of characteristics, this is the MFG system, either studied in PDE form or in forward backward forms. And this is what we are going to do now. And the strategy will be the same. We want to expand the analog of our semi group along the empirical measure. And what is the analog of our semi group? This is calligraphy Q, which is the solution to the master equation. So, really, you have to visualize this in your mind. I know this is a bit complicated. We have a nonlinear equation on the space of probability measures. The nonlinearity comes from the optimization <laughs> layer. We want to study some convergence between from particle to mean field. And if there were no optimization, our PDEs would become linear PDEs. And then we would just have expanding those linear PDEs along the particle system. The very drawback of this is that we require a lot of regularity on the solution to the PDE because when we make all these expansions, we want to, 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 to upper bound the remainders and for sure to upper bound those remainders here and here, we have to require uh, some regularity on the solution of the PD on the space of probability measure. Except for that, this was the, the, the reason why I wanted to make this detour. The argument, in fact, you can rephrase this even if uh, the problem has no, uh, no, um, no optimization. And, and by the way, this strategy, some people use this strategy recently in the analysis of particle system uh, without optimization to make some uh, uh, error expansion uh, when, uh, uh, when capital N increases uh, in propagation of chaos. So, so really this, this, this question without, uh, without optimization, this is interesting. Okay, back to what I wanted to say. Now it becomes more demanding in terms of notation. I'm sorry about this. I will try to be... Uh, um, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, can you do something very similar on a larger scale to prove the propagation of chaos of the laws of the space of trajectory? Ah, you want to do this at the level of the trajectories themselves? Yes, like uh, the, to convert the law of the process to the degree, the whole process, not the dimensional. Uh, so, it, it depends exactly what you have in mind. So, um, you mean that in the particle system? But I take the new and the measure of, of the of, past. Of, of the past. 
So it means that now your PDE, this would be your PDE on the space of probability measures on the path. Yes. So possibly you could uh, write this uh, formally. I presume that you could do that formally. Uh, maybe what would be demanding is to, to say what it means to have uh, classical solutions, certainly, because now your derivative, uh, you see your derivative, these are, deri so you would have functional on the space of probability measures on the path space. And so um, the dictionary would be between the Wasserstein derivatives on this big space <laughs> and derivatives on the space. Uh, does it make sense what I'm saying? So this would be derivatives on, on the path space. Um, so this could be, uh, I have never tried, but this could be, uh, I think that what I'm saying is correct. B is sufficient to regularly know that the laws converge that the, on the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so maybe this is possible. I'm just wondering whether some people did this or not. Maybe I'm confusing. Uh... I know some people did this, but for marginal models. Ah, for marginal models, yes, yes. But you won't pass. So I, I we have to discuss more about this. I, I see your question. Uh, uh, the point is that if you, I just want to adapt this, uh, you, you, you get something that is a very, very big equation. I'm just wondering whether you have to go uh, up to this uh, very big equation or you can simplify a little bit, but this is not clear in my mind. But formally, it would be a very, very, uh, an equation of a very, very big space. Why not? I'm wondering whether some people did that or not. I'm not sure. But maybe Francesco would know that. Um, okay, this is a question we have to discuss. With. Thank you. Now, uh, something that is a bit painful. This is before lunch. Um, okay, so we are back to the to the particle system, and this is the Nash equilibrium. This is the Nash equilibrium. So, <laughs> take e is equal to zero to simplify. These are the dynamics of the particles at the equilibrium of the n particle system. So this is exactly the same as in my detour, except that now the drift is given by the result of the minimization. And so this is given by VNI, and this VNI is the solution to the Nash system. But really, if you want to think in terms of the particle system that I wrote in my detour, this is the same, except that VNI, uh, so the, the, the velocity field, comes as a result of an optimization step. Somehow, these particles, these are my characteristics, or these are the mu bar n in my previous argument. So I'm going to test the master equation, certainly, in some way, along those particles. This is what I want to do. So complicated notations, but the meaning is not so complicated. So the first line, so you, you see that if you remember what we did before the break, we had little v for the solution of the Nash and little u for the projection of the master of the solution to the master equation. So you have on the top line little v and little v, on the second line little u and little u. Okay, what is the first uh, line? So straight y. This is the value. This is the value that you have to pay when you are sitting on the Nash equilibrium. So this is XTN1, XTNN, so this is exactly your Nash equilibrium. You sit down on this Nash equilibrium and you see how much you have to pay till the end of the game. 
This is VNI, and V, this is the real mesh. Now you, you do the same. This is your analog of the semi group in, in the previous slides. You take the approximate the projection given from the infinity, U and I. This is an approximated cost, or this would be the cost in the energy. You sit on the same particle and you compute this cost. So with V, this is the real cost. With U, this is a kind of idealized cost in the mean field approximation. But you sit on the same particles. Really, that's the key point. You sit on the same particles. So this is the Nash equilibrium given by the derivative of the Vienna. So I think that this is calligraphic Y and straight Y. Now you do the same for the derivatives, exactly the same for the derivatives. Why do we need the derivatives? Because it's going to give us uh, the Hamiltonian and uh, the optimal strategy and so on. Okay, so you do the same for the strategies and, and this is painful because you see that you need two indices, I and J. I is for the index of the player in the, uh, in the values and J is for the, the label of the derivative that you take when you take a derivative. Okay, you will see exactly why we need this straight Z, straight Z and calligraphic Z. Okay, now you say, what is the evolution of the value straight Y? If you remember what I said yesterday morning about forward backward stochastic differential equation, this is it. This is the evolution of the cost or the value along my particles. This is exactly the same principle. And now this is just an application of Ito's formula. This is the verification theorem that I mentioned yesterday. It is exactly the same. When I compute the value, this is very simple. In fact, I'm just paying the kinetic energy of my control and the kinetic energy of my control. This is the square of straight Z because straight Z, this is exactly the derivative. I have to be careful in the indices. I and I, the strategy is the derivative with respect to XI for player I. And I have the running cost. And then uh, when I apply it was formula, uh, I have uh, all these uh, stochastic integrals. Take eta is equal to zero to simplify, but if you want, you can restore the presence of eta. This would be uh, in these computations, this would be the same. This is a bit painful when you have when you write down uh, the, the first order derivatives with respect to dwj because you have plenty of noises. So you have uh, the sum over all the jets. So you have uh, n noises, and so you, you have n stochastic integrals, and they are driven by those z, and this is the interest for having the z uh, in the notations. So this is the dynamics of the values, the real values. And now you do the same, which is somehow the same as in my D2, except that this is nonlinear. You compute the idealized value or the value given by the MFG along the same cloud of particles. And to do that, to do that, you use the approximated Nash system that we obtained before the break. So if I expand this, this calligraphic Y, this is really U and I, and U and I, we know that it's also the Nash system. So when I apply my uh, Ito's formula, I will see plenty of derivatives, and I have to make plenty of consolation, and it will give me the following expansion. So let me explain. On the top line, where is my pointer? It is here. On the top line, <coughs> this is the analog of this Z, but except that this is calligraphic Z. This is the cost associated with the strategy or uh, the UNI. So this is the derivative of the UNI for the reason that in the approximated Nash, what I have is really the derivative of this UNI. There is the Hamiltonian. And there is a remainder. This is exactly the remainder that I had, that I had in my approximated Nash. This was of size one over n. So this term is very, very small, this, uh, this remainder. And then I have exactly the same stochastic integral as before. This is exactly this term. 
This is the same. Stochastic integral, they come from Ito's formula, except that this is calligraphic Z instead of Z itself. And now I have another term, which is a bit, uh, a bit painful, a bit delicate. It comes from the fact that the characteristics of the approximated Nash, if I really wanted to duplicate this, if I wanted to have exactly the same equation, but replacing Z and Y by calligraphic Y and calligraphic Z, I should replace in the particle system little v by little u. Because somehow the particle system, these are the characteristics of the Nash. Now, if I replace the Nash, in the Nash, I replace little v by little u, I should do the same and I should replace dxv by dxu. But I don't do this. I want to evaluate u and i along the cloud of particles driven by little v. And so you see, I am paying here for the distance between little v or the derivative of little v and the derivative of little u. This is exactly coming from the fact that <laughs> I don't use the derivative of u, but the derivative of v when I evaluate u. So there is another term that does not appear in this line. It appears here for the simple reason that I don't use the correct drift somehow. Except for this difference, I get these two equations. And now what I'm going to do is just to compare the two equations and to make a stability argument. And what I expect is to be able to propagate the remainder term one over n to the differences or to the difference between the two equations. Just one word about the boundary condition. The boundary condition, they are the same. So the black button is going to disappear in a few seconds. They are the same, the boundary condition. So this is the bottom line. They are the same and they are evaluated at the same cloud of particles. So they disappear when you make the difference. Okay. So now you make the difference between calligraphic Y and straight Y. Where is my pointer? Here. Okay, you make this difference. And you make the difference between the two equations. So uh, the differences between the drift, uh, the, 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 the running cost, uh, they disappear. Uh, you have this remainder, which is of size 1 over n. This is pretty easy. You have the differences between the stochastic integral here. You can remove because this is the common noise. Here, these are the independent noises. And here, you have this uh, correction that comes from uh, the fact that I'm not using the right characteristic system, and I have the differences between or the difference between the Hamiltonians. Okay. <laughs> and once again, at the terminal time, they are equal. So now this is a question of stability for backward stochastic equations. So you see that yesterday I told you. Uh, uh, you can use one approach or another approach when you study midfield games, but here, for this analysis, this is quite convenient to use backward stochastic differential equations. So it really depends on, on the problem. Sometimes uh, you get more information, or it, this, this is easier to, to use uh, one approach instead of the other one. So, so you see that uh, um, you, you really see the interest for this second formulation uh, now. Okay, so here this was a, a differential writing of the of the equation now i can integrate so you see that when i integrate between little t and capital t i can rephrase the differential the differential formulation in a macroscopic formulation so i have the value at time t here in the left of the difference i integrate all the big term that you have in the right hand side <laughs> No, certainly here there is a mistake. So I'm sorry, a uh, mistake on my slide. Uh, I don't know why. So I forgot. I don't know why I forgot this. Uh, ah, no, I said I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said if there is no DT term. I'm sorry. If there is no DT term. Sorry about this. I say if there is no DT term. So if I if there is no DT here and no DT here. So if I assume directly that this is equal to zero, then this is what I would would obtain. And this is a way to show you that in this case, I would directly have the convergence for the simple reason that in this, uh, in this uh, left-hand side, the, left, the, the first term, yt, 
is orthogonal to the stochastic integral. When you have a stochastic integral between little t and capital T, this is orthogonal, linear 2, with any term that is observable at time t. So this is a result from stochastic integration. So this is just to show you that, in fact, the stochastic integrals in this uh, writing, they are not a problem. This is the philosophy of this, uh, of this uh, line when there is no DT term. So this is what I'm saying. So since, since they're orthogonal, you will get that the difference between the cost is 1 over n squared. And even more, you are able to compare the strategies, the dx little u and dx little d, just from the, the result that you have, uh, uh, just from the fact that you have this, uh, and these are s, I'm sorry, these are s, and this is ds. And I'm sorry, this is the s, s, and this is ds. So you are able to compare the strategies when you take i is equal to j here, you have a comparison between the strategies. And you see here that in this argument, we are really, really using the fact that there are some independent noises. The same proof without noises, we don't know how to do that. It's more or less an open question. And uh, it's not clear that uh, we can adapt it directly. And I, once again, I'm pretty sure that this is still open at this time. Um, OK. Now I have to restore the presence of the DT term, so these two terms. And now I'm saying, well, if there were some DT terms, so you would have exactly the same inequality, but plus exactly those DT terms. So the first one would be, so you would have, you would pay for these differences. Here, this one, this Z, this is the derivative of little u. But remember that the derivative of little u, this is 1 over n times the Wasserstein derivative. The Wasserstein derivative, I assume it to be bounded. So this is basically, I get basically 1 over n times the difference of this, of this term. I take a square. So, so there, is, there is a square on the left and a square on the right. So this is a homogeneous. And I can say, OK, this guy is going to be uh, more or less uh, canceled by, by what I have in the left. And also, the difficulty, in fact, in the proof is to compare the Hamiltonians because they are quadratic. And if you want to make some stability, for sure, this is not uh, Lipschitz. This is just locally Lipschitz. And you don't have, in practice, you don't have a bound on straight Z. You have a bound on calligraphic Z because of the master equation. But uh, the straight Z comes from the Nash system, and you don't have a bound, a uniform bound. So here there is a. In, in the real computation, you have to pay uh, you have to pay some price for this, but I'm not going to to explain to you. Uh, so assume that I do have uh, as if this were Lipschitz, and so in that case, you just have the square of the difference. And so this is a fine inequality. You can uh, uh, you can tune an additional parameter by using some convexity argument that I'm not, not going to detail, so that you can observe this term in the right. You can observe it. Uh, by using or by means of the, of the term that you have in the left. And in the end, what you get is exactly that the differences between the values and the strategies, uh, this is ii here, uh, this is less than 1 over n or 1 over n squared when you have the, when you have the square inside the left-hand side. So this is to say that back to my original particle system, the, the strategies were driven by straight z. And in fact, this is not that far from the same particle system driven by calligraphic Z. And this is more or less the result. This is what you wanted to prove. Because calligraphic Z is exactly the, the same system, but driven by the derivative of the master equation. And so up to a very small term that is of size 1 over n, you get the fact that the two particle systems are really, really close. Uh, so uh, I don't, uh, yes, I, I think that this is what I wanted to say here for this, uh, uh, for, for this, uh, for this analysis. So as a summary, you solve the PD in infinite dimension, you project it back in finite dimension, and uh, you expand the solution to this PD along the particle system. This is the way it works. So may, maybe a bit of bibliography about this. Um, so we use this in, um, in a model with, uh, with the presence of optimization. But 
there were earlier references uh, with similar, uh, not exactly the same, but similar ideas <coughs> without optimization. So um, there was a book by Kolokoltsov on the nonlinear or diffusion processes, and uh, more or less, more or less, these are exactly stated in the same way, but there are some similar ideas. And maybe uh, in a more uh, striking manner, you can find this in uh, some works by Clément Mouault and uh, uh, Stéphane Michelin uh, uh, in the, around the 2012, 2013. Uh, there are similar, this is not exactly written in the same way, but uh, this is, in fact, the spirit is very, very much the same. So, but this was before without optimization. Okay. Just to tell you a conclusion about what we did. So this is just a summary of, of what we did. So we started from DXI is the derivative of VNI. So this is the drift. And we said, <laughs> this is not that far from the same particle system, but where we have replaced DX VNI by the derivative of the master equation. So this is with a bar here, you see that I put a bar on the X. This is to say that this is another particle system. But I'm saying that in fact, our analysis allows you to say that the two particle system are really, really close. And in fact, the two of them are close up to a distance one over capital M. This is really the, the conclusion of the analysis that we did. You have this particle system associated to the Nash. And here, this is the particle system taken from the, uh, from the master equation. And, and, and the fact that you have the comparison between the two of them, this is very interesting from a practical point of view, because we know plenty of things about the asymptotic behavior of this particle system. For sure, we have propagation of chaos, which is basically to say that the empirical measure is going to converge towards the theoretical measure. And so the empirical measure of this one is going also to converge to the solution of the main field game. But we have many more information for those of you who, knows, uh, who know probability uh, quite well. When you have uh, uh, stochastic convergences, you wonder about rates. So you can write rates as bounds for the expectation of the distance or the distance of the square, but you can go further. You can wonder about a central limit theorem. You can wonder about large deviation principle. And so these are questions that we can solve here. You can wonder for the empirical measure. It makes sense to wonder about having a CLT, so when you know that the empirical measure converges towards some measure, you want to know what is the rate, and if you know the rate, if you're normalized by the rate, do you, do you have a limiting uh, random variable, which is exactly what you have in the central limit theorem. Another question is what about exceptional bad behavior, which is a large deviation principle. When do you have that the distance between the two objects is really, really big? And so uh, I'm not going to detail this, but these are things that we, we, know, uh, we know how to do. And in practice, it might be interesting. Uh, we know how to have large deviation and, and central limit theorem on the particle system here. And then we know how to transfer to the original ones. So we know, to, we know how to have central limits for the distance between the empirical measure of this system and the solution of the military game and large deviation for the distance between the empirical system of this one, the empirical measure of this one, and, uh, and the, um, the solution to the, to the mean field game. So it might be interesting in practice. Uh, you wonder about uh, risk uh, because uh, you are using, uh, you are using uh, I don't know, uh, the, the solution of the mean field game. And in fact, uh, this is not what you have in practice. In practice, the players, maybe they play the right, the true Nash equilibrium. And you wonder about the probability to have uh, exceptionally uh, a very large distance between the empirical measure of the system and the solution to the Nash, because you want to, to see uh, what would happen in your system if you had a very, very large deviation. And then this is, uh, you can quantify precisely uh, what would be the probability of these, uh, of these events. So for sure, the probability would be very, very small, but for risk analysis, uh, this, would be, uh, this could be uh, useful. So I'm not going to, to give you the, the precise results, then you have to make the computation. And we did some papers on this direction with uh, Laker and Ramanan. But just to say, the, the interest for the analysis based on the master equation is that a posteriori, uh, you can get further information about the rate of convergence. 
so here on the slides, uh, you will find some information about the CLT. Uh, uh, I have to say that uh, Sylvie, uh, so I have a map, and many of you know Sylvie, uh, she, she did a lot about uh, CLT for, for particle systems um, and solar irrigation. But I, I, don't, I don't want to enter the details. I think that uh, this was enough, uh, enough uh, stuff for this, uh, for this morning. So just to conclude, so I think that I have a couple of minutes to, to conclude. This is not the only method to address um, to address the convergence of um, of the Nash equilibria towards the solution of the mean field game. Here, what I did is that I used the master equation. This was one motivation, or this is one motivation for studying the master equation. It provides very uh, very interesting information about the convergence. But now, as I said in introduction of this lecture this morning, you could wonder about all those strategies. And if you think of the uh, results that you know about convergence, something that is very, very natural is to have a look at compactness. So you, you just try to get some a priori estimates on your model. If this is compact for some topology, uh, what about the weak limits? What about the limits? What about the limiting points? Uh, do they solve the uh, midfield game? Or what can we say about this? And so this is something that was studied by uh, by Daniel Laker. This is something that I mentioned yesterday. He did a lot uh, about this, and what he did is, is really, really nice. And Fabrice Jeté, uh, who is in CEMAP, uh, um, he was able to extend in a very nice way the results of Laker to more complicated uh, types of midfield games. So if you know Fabrice, you can discuss with him. And in particular, to games uh, with uh, interaction uh, through the law of the control, so midfield interaction on the controls. Okay, I will be quite fast, uh, but I, want, I wanted to say a, a, something <laughs> about the work of Daniel because I think that in the field uh, this was uh, this was really uh, very nice and and, and, and this had a, a strong impact. So the, I'm coming back to the case when there is no there is no common noise. So, so once again, the very simple uh, linear case in the in the in the drift, and plus the noise. And so we don't want to use any knowledge about uh, the midfield game. And so we don't require uniqueness and we don't require uh, any, uh, any stability properties. And so we don't have the master equation. So this was the question raised by Daniel. So what can we say directly without any further equation? And so what Daniel said is that, okay, uh, let's have a look at the Nash equilibrium for the n particle system or for the Nash, for the n player game. And we want to prove some limiting behavior about the empirical measure. I'm going to prove that this is compact in some sense. And what about the limiting points? Do they solve the MFG? So the very first question is, what do you mean by uh, compactness? So in probability, when we speak about compactness, we mean about, or we mean compactness of the distributions of the law, of the laws, not of the random variables. The variables, this is more complicated, but the laws, this is much easier to get compactness on the sequence or of the sequence of probability measures. This is what we call tightness, basically. So, this is something that I told yesterday. That you don't want the tails, or you want to control uniformly the tails of your random variables. Here, the random variables, these are uh, probability measures, or these are path taking values in the space of probability measures, but we can equip this with a nice distance. I explained this to you yesterday, and so it makes sense to wonder about the tails of this. So fine, having a compactness of this, uh, this is possible and not that difficult. And now, once again, you wonder about the limiting points. But the very bad uh, part is uh, when you try to pass to the limits in the dynamics, you would like to say that in the limits, your dynamics will be controlled because you want to recover in the end a, a mean field game and in the mean field game you see controls and the difficult stuff is to say what does it mean to pass to the limit on the controls because i told you that you have very few information about uh, the, the control uh, the feedback function it's more or less hopeless to control uniformly uh, their regularity uh, as the, 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 the dimension increases and if you study those uh, controls as random variables, uh, you, don't, you don't know any good topology uh, to have compactness. So this is the point where uh, an additional notion comes in, which is the notion of relaxed control. 
this is a way to compactify the controls by embedding the controls into probability measures. Once again, this is easier to provide uh, compactness for probability measures than for random variables. And so the early, this is not the idea of Daniel. This one, that's what it comes back to a control theory. I think that Nicole, who was here, Nicole Ricard, she did a lot on, on relaxed controls in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and so the idea is to say, if you have a control, so which is, uh, so this is uh, a random variable, you can regard this control as a probability measure. I'm, I'm sorry, there is a DT missing on the right hand side. I did another mistake. And so you regard your control as a probability measure on the on the on the set of values uh, for the control. So this is what I called yesterday by capital A. So this is the the action set or the set of possible actions for the control. So once again, DT is missing in the right hand side, and this is to say this notation is just to say that when you have a, a standard control, you can put a probability, uh, not a probability, a measure. In fact, this is a finite measure, so this is almost a probability measure. And then you rephrase, you reformulate your dynamics uh, by, by saying that your control alpha is achieved by taking the mean of your probability of, you, of your measure Q. So when you compute A of Q, so Q is QT is a probability measure on RD, so on the space, on the set of your controls, or the values for your controls. And so the mean of this quantity, when well, if you replace Q by the delta mass, this is exactly alpha T. So if you have alpha T, you regard the QT as being a delta mass of, uh, at alpha, and in fact, the mean is exactly alpha. This is when you are given alpha. But now you relax and you say, I allow for more general dynamics, which are not necessarily driven by delta masses, but they might be driven by wider controls, namely uh, controls for which Q is a probability measure on the set of actions. This is a way to randomize the values of the controls in some sense. And you do the same in the cost functional. So in the cost functional, instead of computing alpha squared, I'm going to compute the second order moment of my probability, uh, uh, my distribution probabilities on the action sets. And so this is a way to relax the notion of optimal control, or of control, I should say, of control, to uh, the control I have for a mean field game. So when the environment is fixed, I can say I'm going to relax. I'm going to relax the notion of, uh, of optimizers or of control and so of optimizers. Okay, let me go on in the story. The reason why this is, uh, this is uh, very good is that once you have done that, this is much easier to provide compactness arguments on Qs because once again, Qs or QTDT, these are finite measures. And once again, this is the same story as before. This is easier to get compactness on finite measures just by controlling the tails of those measures. And so now you have a way to compactify the actions themselves and possibly to study the weak, weak because this is in the weak sense for the measure. So the limiting points in the weak sense. And so you wonder about what happens in the limits. And so the first step is to say, if you take a sequence of Nash equilibria, what kind of dynamics do you recover in the limits? So this is just an intuition about what you have. In the limit, you have a relaxed version of your dynamics. So with some Q, so Q is obtained uh, as, a, as a limit of your, as a weak limit of your relaxed controls in your, uh, in your finite games. And the difficulty here, there is one difficult thing is that Q is going to be random. This is a, Q is, is, when you cast your limit, this is random. And the first step is to say, well, fine, but this randomness, you can write it as an observation or as depending on the observation of the state variable and the limit 
of the environment. When you pass to the limit, at the same time, you also have to, go, to pass to the limits on the measures, so on the empirical measures describing the, the population. And in the limits, you get, in the weak sense, random variables on the space of probability measures. And this is exactly what you observe here. So mu is a weak limit on the empirical, of the empirical measures in your, uh, in your particle system. And the second point is that you get a form of fixed point condition, which is absolutely similar to the fixed point condition that you had in the MFG by saying that mu is the law of X. But this is a little bit more complicated than being the law of X because mu itself now is random. So it cannot be the law of X. In fact, this is the law of X given mu itself. So it makes the notion a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is the reason why I don't want to enter the details. But just to give you a, a flavor of what it means, so you pass to the limits of mu in the weak sense. So the laws are converging towards the laws <laughs> from random variables. So the limiting random variable is mu. And the same for the actions. The laws are converging. And in the limit, you can write the following dynamics for the limiting equilibrium or the limiting dynamics of the equilibrium. And so once again, you have a relaxed form of the control and you have a relaxed version of uh, the fixed form because you see that mu is not exactly the law of X. This is the law given mu itself because mu is random. This is a random value. So this is the first step in his, uh, in his work. I have to say that mu, which is random, you can prove that this is independent of the noise that you have here. And this is something that you can prove. OK. Uh, non, je vois les collègues. Oui, non, je les ai. Les gens sont là. Ah, ça va. OK, c'est une vision. Non, il m'a dit qu'il avait perdu la connexion. Qui ça Le mot qu'il utilise à moi. Ah, attends. Les gens sont là Non, les gens sont là. Do you hear us? Do you hear us? Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for discussion. So very, very last slide uh, for, for, for this morning. Uh, I think that after this, yes, so this is almost done. Uh, I, I will stop uh, in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so the second step in the, in the, so this was the first step in the proof of, uh, of Daniel. The second step is, to address the cost and to see that when, when you have a weak convergence, uh, you can pass to the limit <coughs> in the cost. Because not only you want to say that you have some uh, dynamics in the limit, but you want to say that these dynamics are optimal. So it, it means that you have to compute and to pass to the limit in the cost. And so this is one result that you have in this, uh, in this paper is that the cost that you have in the limit so this is the cost that is, that is associated with this relaxed formulation of the energy. Uh, this, is, uh, this is indeed the limit of the cost. So you see that the, the way you, you, you write down this limit is that you tack the cost to any player i in the population. So when you have the star here, this is really the star. So this is the Nash in the n particle system. You see that you have this strange notation n little n. This is to say that we are doing this along the subsequence because this is by compactness. And you average not only over omega, but you also average with respect to the index of the player. So you take all the players in the, in the Nash, you make the average of this with respect to the indices, and you pass to the limit. You could wonder why we make this average. In fact, the assumptions that, uh, that he has are quite general, and this is a way to symmetrize uh, the Nash in the in the um, in the end player system. So there is no study of of any a priori symmetry properties of the Nash in the work of Daniel, but you symmetrize uh, by uh, by making this uh, empirical. And so once you have done this, you pass to the limit, and you say, well, this is the limiting cost. Now you want to make or to have a look at a deviating particle, which is something that is demand that, that is required in the definition of a mean field game. And this is the most, diffi the most difficult proof in, in, in the, the most difficult step, sorry, the most difficult step in the, in the work of Daniel. Uh, by the way, he did uh, just a little bit of advertise, uh, advertisement. Uh, we, 
we did a series of lectures uh, with some people in uh, in the US in uh, 2020, and we just released the booklet by the AMS. Uh, there are six chapters, and one chapter uh, has been written by Daniel, and this is very nice. He explained in 30 pages uh, some of these arguments. Uh, he doesn't make the, the, the complete analysis, but if you want to have a look, uh, maybe this is uh, uh, this is a very nice survey on what he did and what he did in uh, in this direction. And so this is a little bit of advertising. So this book by the IMS, a booklet of uh, six chapters, and you will find a, a very nice survey by Daniel on what he did. Okay, so ba uh, back to uh, back to the, the the purpose. So I want to prove that this is the dynamics that I have found are an equilibrium. So if I deviate of if there is a player deviating in the cloud of particles or in the, in, in the infinite cloud of particles, one player that is that is deviating then is going to pay more. So this is exactly what I'm going to say here. If you play now another relaxed control, so this is what you see here, another control. Oh, sorry. You play another control, then basically you say you pay more with the with this new control than with the control Q star that that I have found uh, by uh, by taking the weak limits of the particle system. Okay, there is a, a little <laughs> bit of work in the in the paper to say that you can reduce uh, to a similar problem where you just uh, have a look at the uh, measures Q that only depend on the current state of the population. But forget about this. And so this is uh, this is the the, the last uh, the last thing I wanted to say. What he does is that he says, okay, when I have this cost here, uh, I'm sorry, here there is no star, there is no star here. This is not the optimal one, so this is really the one that is driven by Q. I have to reinterpret this cost as the limit of cost in the particle system, because in the particle system I know that if I deviate, I'm going to pay more. So if I have a cost in the limit, I'm going to interpret this cost as a limit of cost in the particle system. I'm using the fact that in the particle system, if I deviate, I will pay more and I will pass to the limit on the inequality. And so this is exactly the main step that you have to do. You have to say that, so when you have a deviating player in the population that changes Q star for Q, then you can say that the cost here is the limit of those costs. And then, uh, uh, so, so uh, in, this, in this notation, so here xi, this xi here means that the player number i plays this strategy q, and the others are keep playing um, what I call mu bar minus i. It means that the other ones are playing the Nash, the Nash, in the uh, in the finite game, so everybody is playing the Nash strategy or the feedback strategies at the equilibrium, except I, and I is playing Q. And the key point is to prove that you can prove that in this way, this player is deviating, so it's going to pay more. And if you pay more, this cost that you have here is larger than the cost that you have at the equilibrium, and passing to the limit, you get exactly uh, no, I think there is no conclusion. Sorry about this. You get exactly the, the inequality. You prove this inequality by saying that this limit is going to be greater than this uh, than this cost. Mm -hmm. So, so the difficult point really in the proof is to show the last step when you deviate. The cost that you have is the limit of cost in the n particle system, and then you can use the definition of the Nash in the particle system. Okay, so I think it is uh, it is uh, quite early. I think this is a good point to stop. So this is what I wanted to say about the convergence problem. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll do different things. Uh, we will come back to uh, common noise, but from a, another perspective, I will come back to easier models and show you that sometimes uh, common noise can be helpful. Yeah, this is what I'm going to tell you in the afternoon. Very well. What are the differences between that and F on G? You have two strategies in the same world for the same. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I forgot to say that. So, 
because this is a very good question. I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. So, for the master equation, <coughs> the strategy that uh, requires the stability and uniqueness of the equilibria. So, basically, you need some monotonicity condition on F and G. So, if you think of a control problem, it would mean that the potential that you have on the top of this has very nice convex structure. In this uh, method, since you are just working with compactness, uh, what you say is that you don't care about uh, uniqueness in, in the limits. You just say, in the limits, I'm going to get some uh, equilibrium. I just want to check that the weak limits are equilibrium. So for sure, you need less conditions. There are two limitations in this uh, strategy, in the compactness method. The first one is that the notion of equilibrium that you get, and, and maybe I was a bit short on this, is relaxed. So this is slightly weaker in the sense that typically you see that the measures or, or the, the environment are random and you have the, the matching problem in terms <coughs> and the minimization the combination of the meaning of this uh, this uh, fixed point and the optimality conditions means that this is not exactly the same uh, the same condition as as in a, a classical energy the classical MFG satisfies this, but the, the converse is not correct. So this is a relaxed notion. So passing to the limit, you get a relaxed form of energy. So this is the first thing. And the second point is that for sure, since this is compactness, you have no right of convergence. So this is just to say you have convergence and that's it. Uh, so I think that the two of them are, the two of them are complementary, but in terms of assumption, for sure, the second one is less demanding. You don't need uniqueness, you don't need stability. And so, less conditions on the coverage. Thank you for this question. I forgot to say that. 